What's up, everybody? We are here trying to keep up with this Sarah Boone case. It seems like it's moving so fast towards trial on October 7th. How are we going to get there? I don't know. In today's video, we're going to talk about the case management conference right before trial. What's going on? What still needs to be done? We're going to talk about Frank Banklets, one of Sarah Boone's old lawyers, talking about her case and what it's like to represent her, and also what he thinks about this motion to suppress based on the incomplete uh, or invalid Miranda warnings, trying to suppress all of those statements she made in the two-hour interrogation. We're going to talk about the state's response to that motion to suppress and whether they think Miranda was violated or if those statements are going to come in. And then lastly, we're going to get to hair and makeup. Will Sarah Boone get it? Should she get it? Is it an appropriate motion? We'll talk about all that and more, hopefully answer your questions. Let's get into it. Hopefully you guys also enjoyed the podcast this morning on Sarah Boone getting Whitney's take, no legal background, but somebody from the outside, how they view a case, a potential juror, some might say on Sarah Boone's case, what does she think about it, where it stands, what has she seen? I thought it was interesting. Hopefully you guys did too. If you haven't, please go check it out on our YouTube channel. It's the podcast with Whitney and I talking Sarah Boone, summarizing the whole case. If you don't know about this case, you can get a good summary of it over there as well and catch up all in about one hour. But in these videos, we take an hour on individual topics or a couple small topics like today. And we're going to start with um, Frank Bankowitz going on court TV. I thought it was interesting. I always get a little nervous here because just because he's not her lawyer doesn't mean there's no attorney-client privilege. That attorney-client privilege lives the entirety of Sarah Boone's life unless she waives it. It is the client's privilege. The defense attorney cannot waive it. There are certain circumstances if you're being sued or threatened or things like that. But in normal circumstances, it is the client's privilege and only the client can waive it. And if she doesn't give an attorney permission to discuss what they talked about, then you can't talk about it. So we'll talk about if he gets into any gray areas, but always interesting to hear a, an attorney or a juror after a case reflect and talk about what it was like. So we're going to get that out of Bankowitz today. Doing this and uh, talk to us a little bit, please, about what it was like to represent Sarah Boone. Well, it was an unusual situation. Um, case had a lot of publicity and Miss Boone uh, was very involved with her own defense and she wanted her attorneys to be also that involved uh, regardless of what other cases they had. So it, it was, it was an experience. Sure. So right off the bat, uh, high publicity, high profile media attention and her being involved in the case and wanting her attorney to be involved in the case. I don't see any major issues with that. Right. I, I think that's fair for a client to want that. Um, and, and every client wants, you to treat it like it's your only case. And while that is impossible and you have other clients, there are ways to deal with that, ways to explain it to clients, but ways to also make them understand how much time you are working on their case and make them feel comfortable with the amount of time working on that case, which he never was able to do with Sarah Boone. And it seems a little bit like he's putting the blame on her. What do you guys think? I know most of you don't like Sarah Boone already, but what, what do you think about his comments? Sure. And I know right now her current legal team is saying they're going to present battered spouse syndrome as their defense. And I understand that that was also something that you had intended to present, but there was a problem that Sarah had with it. What was that, Frank? Uh, so there was a problem that Sarah had from it. Seems like we're teetering on something she talked to you about, something you guys discussed. Uh, he wanted to do battered spouse as well. So there were multiple lawyers that have confirmed now they were going to do battered spouse, but it seems like there was a disconnect on how they were going to present the evidence or the defense. She did not like the expert witness that we had chosen to assist in that defense and could not get along with that person. Uh, at times refused to communicate, uh, meet with, or do any assistance with the expert that we had retained. Mm, so, an issue. so while that's teetering on maybe some confidence between lawyer and client, I think it's possible some of that is public record. Um, and he's going to mention later, and here's what's important. He is going to mention later as kind of a blanket CYA that a lot of this is in her letters that are all public record that she put out there. So she waives the privilege for anything that she writes in the letters. Um, and, but when it comes to refusing to meet with somebody, maybe there is a record documenting she refused to meet with this person. I would just always be careful giving a client's reasoning as to why you guys as a team didn't do something or why she didn't do something personally, because usually her reasoning would come out in statements. So just always have to be careful with that confidentiality and that, that privilege issue with an expert. Okay. Uh, and we know that her team is also uh, taking issue with, with something else, um, with the uh, interrogation that was done uh, 
and it was videotaped. We watched it in depth. And apparently they're saying that she was not properly given her warnings pursuant to Miranda versus Arizona. Frank, curious if you agree with that. She was not giving her warnings necessarily on the video itself, but uh, from my investigation, they had been given prior to the actual starting of the camera. That's not good for the defense, right? He's like, yeah, because I mean, this is an impossible question for him, right? He can't help his client with this. And I, I, I don't, I don't like going hard at people. Okay, I just say I wouldn't have done this. When you go hard for your client, representing them zealously, and you're their spokesperson, and you're the one that's supposed to help them through this process and explain things that are going on. When you go in an interview like this and you allow them to ask you questions about the case, because he could take the interview and say, I just can't talk about anything specifically about the case, and they would have respected that, they would have had to. And a lot of people at Court TV are lawyers, so they would have understood it. But this question, what do you think? Are these statements going to be suppressed? It's kind of a lose-lose for Bankowitz and Sarah Boone and that team, because if he says, yes, they should absolutely be suppressed, which would be good for his former client, why didn't you file the motion to suppress then? Is that malpractice on your part? Why didn't you do everything you could? Why didn't you file this motion to suppress? But then if he comes out and says, well, no, I don't think they should be suppressed, that's bad for his former client. And he's bringing information that he knows from his research on the case that they had been given, maybe in depositions or something. Again, it could be public record. So I'm not even necessarily saying he's revealing any confidences, but this is not good now for your former client to say, oh yeah, those Miranda warnings were given prior to the video being turned on. Is that appropriate? Because sometimes that, there's an argument against that. When did you turn your body cam on? When are you supposed to turn your body cam on for policies and procedures? We've seen that come out in cases. Why did you read Miranda before your body cam came on? Just so we couldn't confirm it. Because when we do have the body cam on, you don't read it right. Lawyers will make arguments against those exact things. But it seems like he's saying, ah, nah, the, uh, the Miranda warnings were read before. So I don't think those statements will be suppressed. He does make some arguments in a minute about how those Miranda warnings were not necessarily read correctly, and that is a problem. So then the question is, well, why, why didn't you file this motion to suppress? So it's kind of a lose-lose for him. So I understand why he's in a difficult position here, which is why I probably would have just said, um, I can't talk about the case specifically in that interview. Kind of like Michael Ufferman when he came on my show to talk about Charlie Adelson. He's like, I can't talk about Charlie Adelson's case specifically because I'm representing it, and I don't want to violate privilege. That's all. And I'm not coming hard on Bankowitz. He's been doing it for a long time. I'm sure he's a very good lawyer. I don't know him personally. I'm just talking, critiquing kind of what's going on from Sarah Boone's perspective, from protecting the client, no matter what we think about her, no matter how she treated us as her lawyers, if we were her lawyers, you know, hypothetically speaking, uh, still have to treat them with the dignity and respect and privilege and confidence that the bar holds us to. Uh, Ms. Boone's biggest complaint was the... Um publication of that video by the sheriff's department on such things as YouTube and which has created a, a very uh, impossible task in picking a jury that uh, you know, would be impartial in a case. Understood, Frank. So now he's saying, sounds like he's saying based on conversations with her and I can attest, I have personal recollection of this. Okay. Not everything. I don't have personal recollection with all these cases and all these letters, but she absolutely has said this in her letters before he said, it seems like to me, if I'm going to read between the lines, he said, no, nah, no, nah, she didn't have a problem with the statements as far as it being suppressed from Miranda. Her big problem was it being put out there to the media, uh, put on YouTube, and millions of people are watching now. It's impossible for her to pick a, a unbiased jury. And while he's right, she definitely has a problem with that. He kind of said eh, her problem wasn't to suppress them. Her problem was that it got disseminated, which again, two different arguments and not really great for Sarah Boone, who's trying to suppress those statements right now. Uh, and I have a clip from the interrogation. Let's take a look at it together now. I thought he was okay. Like, I didn't... That, you he's all, telling you he's not. He's telling you, Sarah, I, I can't breathe. He's saying your name, and you're like, that's my name, don't wear it out. Guys, that's how we are with each other. Like, he has... Nobody understands our relationship. This, this whole suitcase thing, never happened before. Mm, okay, I... So she's going to ask the other person there a few questions. I'm going to skip ahead just because we want to hear what Bankowitz has to say more than anything. Um... And they get more into the Miranda warnings and stuff. But uh, that statement, even nobody understands our relationship. That's what her current lawyer, James Owens, is like. Sarah Boone needs to take the stand and explain what happened. She's going to explain what happened before and after those two minutes that are on the video. That's not the whole case. That's what he said in open court. 
This is interesting, and I love that you brought with us uh, with. Uh, your, you know, uh, your discussion points today, that card, so that we could see that that very last line is what defense counsel is taking issue with. So, Frank, back to you on that. Was it legally necessary for these officers to read that line to her? Yes, it was. They, they are required to read the entire card, everything that is on the card. And they uh, normally get a piece of paper that is a checklist of, of what they have instructed or advised against. And they usually have the individual sign that piece of paper. I did not, in my recollection, see that signed uh, waiver card. Oh, this is interesting. So two things there. Number one, good for Sarah Boone. He says, absolutely, they have to read everything. They're required to read everything. Now, you remember, I'll disagree with that a little bit, where they're required, if he means by uh, police policy, gosh, I keep hitting my microphone today, by police policy, they're required to um, maybe that's true. I don't know. I haven't seen this, the sheriff's office uh, policy, but nothing according to the law requires them to read it off of a card verbatim. I've done this research lots of times. And it's funny enough, if you already watched our, my thoughts on the motion to suppress on the last video we did on this, and then we're about to read the state's motion it sounds eerily similar. Um, but from his perspective, he says they are required to read all of that. I don't know whether he means by police pol policy or by case law, because I don't think the case law does require them to read every word on the card. Okay, thank you for that. So this is something big, and Lauren, thank you as well. This is something huge uh, we're going to watch to see if all that footage that we watched on this program is going to be tossed. We'll see. Uh, Frank, uh, with respect to Sarah and the interactions, I understand you had her for about 14 months representing her. Um, did you two get along? Were you able to get along well with her? That's a tough question. <clears throat> uh, we got along uh, as long as I was there uh, and uh, we had open access, uh, which at times we did not. But um, it, it was a matter of seeing her physically that she wanted her attorneys, not just me, but uh, all of her attorneys to be able to be at her disposal. Mm. And that's difficult when you have other clients to represent. Right. Most certainly. Uh, yeah, so again, kind of vague questions and answers. And he's not saying I ignored her. He's not even saying, like, he's not even really responding to some of the complaints she made, which maybe again, because he's protecting privilege there, which I give him a lot of respect for because she said some nasty things about him. So I respect that he's not going hard at her here and violating confidence. Um, but if you remember back to her letters, it wasn't just in-person contact. She wanted specifically with Mr. Bankowitz. She was like, phone numbers don't work. You keep giving me phone numbers. I have an investigator that can't even get a hold of you. Why can't I ever talk to you? It wasn't just about face-to-face. -face. If you look at Sarah Boone's letters, he's saying it was just about face-to-face. -face. So again, he said, she said kind of deal, but you know, it is what it is. Tell us about, you know, your, your job, where your career, where you've, you've worked, where you're currently working. Well, when I first started practicing law, I was, I was an assistant state attorney in the ninth judicial circuit, which is prosecuting Ms. Boone at this time. I was there for about five years. I left there to go with a civil law firm, uh, in the personal injury area. And I left there about maybe three years later and opened my own office. And ever since then, I've been a solo practitioner, uh, basically for the last 50 years. I've been a member of the Florida Bar for 50 years. Well, that's awesome. That's incredibly impressive, Frank. Uh, we knew that you knew your stuff, you know, and see you in action. And, you know, this isn't a problem with any of, of the attorneys that have represented her. Everyone has been so seasoned, so smart. It seems that uh, the common denominator with all the issues is, uh, is Sarah Boone. Uh, and can you tell us quick? Listen, no attorney's perfect. Um, I, I agree with her that they've all been seasoned, but... I think she has some legitimate complaints once in a while. I'll just say it. I don't, and people come at me sometimes when I say that, but some of her complaints are absolutely legitimate in my opinion. We don't know everything that goes on. And we know that obviously she doesn't always tell the truth and she exaggerates. We can prove that with videos and letters from her own mouth, okay? But that doesn't mean that even a liar can't have legitimate complaints sometimes. So I, I don't like to act like nothing that she said was ever legitimate or if it was true and needed to be investigated more, it could have been a problem in my opinion with the representation. Now, was it investigated more? Not necessarily. The judge let her let them part ways. Sometimes she wanted to stay with lawyers even though there were issues. And so I do think we can read a little bit between that. There were a lot of problems at the fault of Sarah Boone. Don't get me wrong. A lot of this was her fault, but I don't think none of it was on the attorneys, I'll just say certain attorneys, not all of them. Why you withdrew? Well, it was the yeah, cumulative effect, so to speak, of the letters that she would send to the judge about he's not doing this and he's not doing that. And there are, all, all these letters are public record. They're all in the court file. 
Uh, eventually, it came down to she even wrote a letter to the judge complaining about the judge not doing his job. Right. And, right. Uh, so, again, these are all in the court file. We remember that. Uh, yeah, she is a real, uh, real piece of work. So why couldn't you represent her anymore? Basically, the letters is what he said. The letters. Uh, Frank Bankowitz, uh, wonderful having you on the program. We would love to have you back sometime to do some analysis on another case. We won't, we won't talk about Sarah, but we'll talk about something else. We'd enjoy your time okay. and your expertise. Thank you so much. And big thanks to Court TV. All right. So that's that. So we heard his comments on the motion to suppress. Now let's take a look at the state's comments on the motion to suppress here. All right. This is the state's motion to strike. This is not a response to the motion to su suppress. It is a motion to strike their motion to suppress and their response. Okay. So usually you would think they're just going to respond to it. But why file a motion to suppress? I'm sorry, a motion to strike. Why do that legally? What's the reason to file a motion to strike versus just responding to it? Well, you would strike something that is legally insufficient. And remember what I said I love to do when lawyers file a motion with no case law and just conclusory statements um, and stating things as facts as if they are true and therefore the judge has to do something without any precedent or rules uh, uh, cited? Well, it's exactly what the state did. And they did it in the form of a motion to strike. So let's take a look here. The defendant's motion is legally insufficient. The defendant recites allegations of facts, but not why any particular fact or facts is, at, is an issue. The reason for suppression as required by Florida Rule of Criminal Procedure 3.190H2 is a boilerplate assertion that, is, that it violated the U.S. Constitution and the Florida Constitution. There is no different, that is no different than stating a search was performed illegally and improperly and unlawfully. You can't just say that. You don't win motions by just saying that. And I can tell you this judge is not going to like that. Somebody who coaches mock trials and explains to teams how to argue these motions, he's not going to like just conclusory statements. You have to, and he even asked for it in court. He's like, Mr. Owens, can you explain to me the case law? Show me case law or statutes or precedent as to why they have to read verbatim what's on the card. Is that actually the law? And Owens is like, I got to go do my research. Well, he did his research, filed his motion. We still don't see a lot of it. Uh, motions to suppress that cited 11 authorities were legally insufficient. The defendant has not cited even a single case that author authorizes the court to grant her relief that she is requesting. It is so hard to get a motion granted when you do not cite a single case. The state is left in the dark about what specific issue or issues the defendant is claiming and what legal authority there might be for the court to grant the relief she requests. It's almost as if Sarah Boone was like, here are my issues. Now, judge, you go find a reason why I should win. Judges do their own researches. Some of them have staff attorneys or JAs or clerks that can help with this. And, you know, they can do their own research and try to figure out what the right answer is in the interest of justice. But you can't do the defense lawyer's job or the prosecutor's job. You definitely shouldn't do the prosecutor's job. Some judges like to do that for them. You can't go find the reasons why you should suppress this motion. It is the defense's job to make those arguments. Unless it's blatantly obvious. The court should strike the motion as legally insufficient. But but by Owens not putting in all this research, he's like, judge, here's the reasons somebody else maybe can find. Why? And also it's important because the state has to be able to respond. So if you cite a bunch of cases, which happens from time to time, that don't actually say what you say they say, or they don't stand for the holdings that you put in there that they say, the state has the opportunity to go do research, respond and say, judge, that's not what that case says at all. We do that all the time. You shepherdize it. You see if it's still good law. It could be bad law. It could have been overturned. There could be a different case that disagrees with it and the judge has to make a decision. There could be controlling case law that disagrees with it. That's why you have to cite the cases so that the other side can read them and see if they're real or not real or good or bad and the judge can differentiate or analogize. That's a lawyer's job, literally. The state objects to any additional claims being raised at the hearing that were not specifically pled in the defense motion. So what else the state's saying is you can't come to the motion hearing with all this case law that you didn't provide me beforehand because again, it's not fair. I have to be able to respond. We have deadlines. We have a trial. We have to prepare for trial. We have to prepare for opening. I need to be able to say if I'm going to be able to say this stuff happened in the interrogation or not. You're preparing your defense. We're preparing our response to your defense. This stuff matters. This stuff's all really important evidence for that. In paragraphs five and six of her motion, she alleges that she was detained for 14 hours. And during this time period, she provided a statement to law enforcement. She does not challenge the admissibility of this statement. 54 hours of detention does not make a statement involuntary. That's what this case says. So it's not just, so they're trying to take the shotgun approach to the state. They're going to try to knock down all these different arguments because they don't really know which one specifically the defense is arguing. 
So if they're arguing that 14 hours is too long, they have stated a case, the Chavez case, that says 54 hours was not too long. Perhaps seven and eight of the defendant's motion allege that law enforcement asked the defendant to turn over her phone that she provided the means to unlock it to law enforcement. Bellevue State is informative on this issue if it is the defendant's proposition that this somehow rendered her statement the following day involuntary. Again, they're like, well, is she saying it's because she turned the cell phone over? Well, this state or this case will knock down that argument. So they're basically lining up arguments for the defendant and knocking them down. Bell makes it, and the bad part about this if you're the defense is you're like, oh, at first you could think, oh, is the state doing my job? Great, the state's doing my research. You don't want the state doing your research for you because what's the state going to do? They're going to research all these ones they know they're going to win. And they're going to say, if this is argument, here's how we win. If this is argument, here's how we win. So you don't want them lining up your arguments because they'll only line up arguments that they can knock down, which frankly, it's their prerogative. They don't have to do your job for you. Bell makes it clear that the police having seized evidence from a suspect and the suspect knowing they have seized evidence from her only goes toward the analysis as whether a future interrogation is custodial, not whether a future statement is involuntary. Because Miranda warnings were provided at the beginning of the interview the following day, this is not a relevant factor for the court to consider. So again, they're saying, even if this was their argument, which it would lose, she was Mirandized. Bell is also informative on the distinction between Miranda violation and involuntary statement, which will be discussed below. So again, Miranda is a custodial interview. Was she in custody? Were they interview type questions? Was it an interrogation? Involuntary means you were forced to talk. So Miranda doesn't really matter if you were forced to talk. And they're saying, first off, Bell is not saying it's an involuntary statement because she turned over her cell phone and, and unlocked it. But even if it was, she was Mirandized, so it wasn't involuntary. And if it was custodial, she was Mirandized. Now they're saying it'll help us to de determine whether it was uh, involuntary or Miranda issue. Paragraph 9 through 11 says the defendant's motion to imply that law enforcement was being deceptive in their manner of summoning her for an interview she did not know was going to occur. Okay, so they're saying they deceived her. They lied to her by saying, you're going to come pick up your cell phone and really they wanted to interrogate her. Pursuant to Bell, this goes to one of the Ramirez factors in deciding whether Miranda warnings were required, not whether a statement is involuntary. Uh, this is different from the deception that would lead to an involuntary statement. The defendant received no promises of hope, leniency, or misrepresentation about the law. So the deception they're talking about here, which makes a statement involuntary, is you won't get charged with anything. I, the officer, will give you immunity. So talk to me. They're forcing her to talk to them basically when they don't have the, they don't have the ability to give her immunity and they're lying and she's not going to get immunity. That's improper. That's an improper deception. That would make the statement involuntary. That would make it null and void even if you read Miranda. You can't lie and deceive like that. Which is why that question, nobody promised you anything. You weren't forced to give the statement. That question was asked to Sarah Moon. And she said, no, nobody promised me anything. Both the United States Supreme Court and the Florida Supreme Court have held that deception alone does not negate voluntariness. So certain deception, we all know, as much as we hate it, but again, you see all the case law cited, Johnson v. State, White v. State. We all know cops can lie. It sucks, it's annoying, I wish they wouldn't, but certain things they can lie about during interrogations. This includes misrepresenting a co-defendant statement. They can say stuff like, well, your co-defendant's spilling their guts over there. False suggestions to law enforcement could arrange a satellite system to put the defendant at the scene. We've got you at the scene. We can prove you were there. Exaggerating the amount of DNA. This always reminds me of uh, Four Brothers. If you remember at the end when they're trying to pin all these crimes on them, they're like, we have this hair. We have DNA. And all the brothers are laughing like, did you get that off of your, and they say inappropriate things, um, your wife's butt or something like that. They're like, yeah, we have this hair. And they use the investigative tactics and they're slamming them on the table and shining the light in their face. Plenty of inappropriate things going on there, but exaggerating the amount of DNA is, is okay. According to Florida law, I hate it. It sucks. I don't think it should be. I think that's totally wrong. I don't think you should have to lie to get your answers. I think that is manipulative and coercive, but according to Florida law, they can lie. Informing a suspect that law enforcement was investigating a missing person case rather than homicide, writing DNA evidence on the whiteboard in an interview room prior to any DNA ana analysis being performed and false representation of physical evidence that did not exist. It sucks, but all that stuff in my great state of Florida is allowed. A lot of states, frankly, it's allowed for cops to lie. I hate it. I wish it wasn't, but it was. So they're saying, even if they brought her there under false pretenses, which frankly, I guess there was false pretenses because they weren't going to give her a cell phone back. So they were lying to her to get her there. But that's not enough to make it coercive or involuntary. Luring the defendant to the sheriff's office under the guise of returning her phone to her, if that's what happened, because they're not admitting that's what happened, does not make the statement involuntary. It only goes toward whether Miranda should have been read, and it was. So they're saying it doesn't make it a coerced for statement. 
Saying we have to talk doesn't make it forced. What it does, though, make it, it sounds like, there are certain things that kind of go back and forth. They're going to argue at certain points that it wasn't custodial. I totally disagree with the state there. I think it was custodial. I think it was an interrogation. We talked about that in the last video. But what they're saying is, even if it was custodial, which we're not necessarily agreeing with, Miranda was red. This is not a situation where Miranda was not read, and therefore we have to go do the analysis, was it a custodial interview? Because if they never read Miranda, they could still try to get the statements in if it was not a custodial interview, and the defendant just spilled their guts without being asked any questions. Paragraphs 12 and 13 also go toward the first Ramirez factor as to whether Miranda should have been read to the defendant. She was led upstairs to one of the interview rooms in the sheriff's office by Detective Lowen, where an interrogation ensued. Okay, they admit interrogation ensued, but they say after Miranda was read. Nor is there any coercion. Although the defendant did not specifically make the claim or cite authority, again, that's the annoying part. They said, oh, it was coerced, but they didn't say this case that I'm citing, you know, they're saying Martin B. State here. In that case, the cop said we have to talk and the judge found that was coercive or forced. They didn't cite any case law like that, which was what was so frustrating about the defendant's motion to suppress. I wish they would have had some case law citing some similar cases that came out the way they wanted it to come out. Allegations in this case, Martin B. State, that the state cites, uh, enforcement, allegations that law enforcement, one, threatened the suspect with the death penalty, two, alluded to the suspect as to what he could expect for himself and from a jury if he confessed, three, deceived the suspect as to the amount of time he had to cooperate with law enforcement, four, promised their favorable testimony and use of their influence during his trial if he cooperated, five, promised to arrange a visit uh, for him with his girlfriend if he cooperated, and six, exploited his re religious belief by relying on a version of the Christian burial interrogation technique. Okay, so all of that in this case, and Martin, there were six different things the cops did. All things I don't like and I wish cops wouldn't do. I hate it. I hate when they do stuff like this and it seems like they're making promises. It seems like they're lying, being deceptive. And guess what? All of those things did not render the statement involuntary. This is how you cite case law and use case law to your benefit when you have a case that's much worse than yours and you still wouldn't have lost. If you would have done all this stuff, you still wouldn't lose, and you didn't even do any of this stuff. So how can you lose here? Though, in that case, and I appreciate the state saying this, the court found that it, pre or it presented the very outer limit as to what tactics law enforcement may employ when performing a custodial interrogation. So it's like, okay, nothing worse than this. You can do these six horrible things, cops. These six deplorable things that you should never do. But even if you do that, the interrogation is good. So when you tell cops this, obviously they're going to do it. That's what I hate about it. So many cops do it because they're like, well, this is the outer technique. But you know what? These cops did in this case. They didn't. Again, you can threaten the death penalty. You can talk about what he can expect if a jury, if he had confessed. That to me is okay. Uh, you can deceive the suspect about the amount of time he has cooperated with law enforcement. Hate that. Shouldn't be able to do that. Shouldn't be able to twist laws because they assume cops know laws, which they shouldn't, but promise their favorable testimony and use of their influence during trial if he cooperated. Again, that team seems like total BS. That's not going to happen. You're not going to get favorable testimony. If you go to trial, you know it's not going to go to trial if they confess. Well, sometimes it still does. But again, that's horrible. Promise to arrange a vision with his girlfriend. Again, totally inappropriate. You can visit with your girlfriend even if you don't confess. Exploiting religious beliefs. Horrible. Come on. We shouldn't need to do this. I know some people are going to say, oh, well, if you get the bad guy, it's all worth it. I don't think you feel that way if it's your rights being trampled on. You know, it, it just sucks. But even that would have been okay. So that's why we look at this situation like slim chance Sarah Boone's going to win this motion. Although the defendant never states that part of the reason she believes her statement should be suppressed was the minimization of her Miranda warnings, nor cites any case law on the subject, the state infers that she believes this in this is an issue due to what she underlined in paragraph 15 of her motion. Yeah, they didn't even say why they underlined the and bolded the words in the last motion. They just did it. There are several cases addressing this issue of minimizing the importance of Miranda warnings. And they cite all these different cases. Saying this is something I have to do is not minimizing according to rights. So they're saying, we're going to cite cases, judge, where we have to do this or I should do this is not enough to say that Miranda wasn't done appropriately. So when Detective Koppel said, so I'm going to read you your rights again because we have to talk about the that. We just have to do it. They were read in a normal cadence like in Chafin. And again, we talked about this in my last video. Um, if you just say we got to do it versus you have to do this right now and are forcing them to in coercive, it really makes a difference. There was no delay in reading them. The defendant is not a juvenile and no claim she's a, uh, definitely no claim she's below average intelligence. 
because sometimes that can come into account if somebody, if the cops know, and we talk about this, I think in making a murderer in that case, in that documentary, how one of the defendants was below average, was very slow, mentally um, not intelligent, wasn't able to understand things and taking advantage of things like though the bar changes depending on who the person is. Well, Sarah Boone will tell you how smart she is and how good she does in school. So there wasn't that issue in this case. She had been read her Miranda warnings just the day before and acknowledged this. It is the defendant who says that it is normal protocol. So even Sarah Boone knows this is normal protocol. These statements by law enforcement did not render her waiver of her Miranda rights involuntary and her statement involuntary. Under a totality of the circumstances analysis, in the balance of paragraph 15 in her, of her motion, the defendant outlines the Miranda warnings as they were given to her by Detective Koppel. Paragraphs 17 through 21 outline what she believes Sheriff's Office Miranda card says and how it differs from what she was told by Det Detective Koppel. Interestingly, the defendant defendants believe that this creates some sort... I'm sorry, the grammar here is because there's only one defendant. Defendant's belief, I think is what it's say that this creates some sort of legal impediment to the admissibility of her two-hour statement that day is not backed up by a single citation to any legal authority within or without the state of Florida's court system. So like I said, what I love to do when no case law is cited, I like to say this multiple times. They did not cite a single case, Judge. And look, look at me, Judge. One, two, three, four, five cases cited just in this one paragraph, Judge. And I cited more throughout my... Memorandum. This judge is going to like that. Instead, she makes a boilerplate assertion in paragraph 22 that her statement was involuntary and her waiver for Miranda rights was involuntary. Fortunately for the state of Florida, there is case law on this issue. There is no specific way that Miranda warnings must be given. We talked about this. We talked about the cases already. And with all due respect to the Orange County Sheriff's Office, they certainly do not have the authority to tell this court what is sufficient Miranda warnings. Now, why are they saying this? Why are they coming out against the Sheriff's Office? The court's already said it. Everybody knows it. Every lawyer knows it. Cops don't come up with what you have to do. Courts do. The legislature does. Rules do. Precedent does. Case law does. And then the cops try to write the best card, or sometimes lawyers write cards for cops to read. But those cards are not case law. The case law still rules. And again, citing more cases here, cases are good. While the four required warnings have become embedded in police practice, the specific words used vary, and the Supreme Court has uh, dictated that the words in which the essential information must be conveyed, I'm sorry, has not dictated. So the Supreme Court has not said it has to be these five words. There is no talismanic incantation required to ensure that Miranda warnings are sufficiently conveyed. Rather, and again, all these cases they're citing, rather, here's what's important, and again, it's exactly what we said in our prior video. This is almost verbatim what I argued in our prior video. Rather, the inquiry is simply whether the warnings reasonably conveyed to a suspect his rights as required by Miranda. The crucial text, sorry, test for determining whether police gave a proper warning is whether the words in the context used, considering the age, background, and intelligence of the individual being interrogated, impart a clear, understandable warning of all his rights. Detective Copsell specifically instructed the defendant on each of her four Miranda rights. And we talked about what these important four rights were. And we talked about exactly how what's even in the defense's motion checks all four boxes. The right to remain silent. Anything you said can and be, will be used against her. She has the right to an attorney before and during questioning. And a lawyer could be appointed if she can't afford one. The detective then asked if the defendant, if she understood these rights, and the defendant said she did. She didn't say, do you waive these rights now that you understand them? That's the big question. Was there a waiver? That's the best argument for the defense. Let's see if the state even talks about the waiver issue or the last question. State B. Owens is directly on point. There, the defendant was read the four Miranda rights, asked if he understood them, and asked if anyone had threatened or promised him anything. There's no mention of any question about whether the defendant wanted to talk to law, law enforcement after he was given Miranda. This was apparently the FBI's Miranda warnings, which were described as exemplary. So there's a case that says even without that final question, the FBI gives exemplary warnings like that. The Miranda decision never contemplated that waiver of counsel could be accomplished by the use, only by the use of the words, I am willing to answer questions without the services of a lawyer. There's no magic in these words. Any clear and unambiguous conduct by a person who has been advised on his rights, which indicates his willingness to answer questions without a lawyer is surely sufficient. So again, 
totality of the circumstances, did it seem like she wanted to talk without a lawyer? And the state is arguing yes. Therefore, if the court does not strike the defendant's motion to suppress for being legally insufficient, it should deny it on its merits. If the court believes that there was a Miranda violation, then the defendant's statements are still available for use during cross-examination, according to Bell. Only if the court finds the statements to be involuntary will the state be prohibited from using them in cross-examination. So that's why they, it's not just a motion to strike, but it's a motion to strike and a response. Because they're saying, Judge, you should strike it. If you don't strike it, you should deny it for these reasons. All right. Um, next, let's... I guess let's do this. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this one, but let's go ahead and just do it real quick. All right. Uh, defendant uh, states memorandum regarding defendant statements to Deputy Rodriguez, Copsell, and Lowen. Uh, Deputy Kayla Rodriguez responded by 911. Shortly before 1 o'clock, Rodriguez activated her body-worn camera. There were three recordings. At no time did the defendant in anything that resembled was in anything that resembles custody for Miranda purposes. The Ramirez case is outlined the famous four-factor test, the manner in which police summon suspect for questioning, purpose, place, and manner of the interrogation, extent to which the suspect is confronted with evidence of his or her guilt, whether the suspect is informed that he or she is free to leave. While Deputy Rodriguez would not let the defendant enter the crime scene, the defendant's home to retrieve a soda or cigarettes, the defendant was not in custody. I think it's arguable whether or not she was in custody right at that moment, but she was clearly in custody later and Miranda was absolutely appropriate. And the defense didn't even ask to strike these statements. They only asked to strike the statements of the interrogation. So I think the state is doing this in anticipation potentially of the defendant arguing about this later. The de deputy was a first responder trying to gather preliminary information about what happened. Defendant was spoken to on her porch and sidewalk area just outside her home. She was not confronted with any evidence because at the time there was nothing to confront her with. The defendant was informed that she was not free to leave the area due to the investigation, but the restraint on her freedom of movement uh, never resembled a custodial arrest. I think that's where there's a little bit of argument, but generally speaking, I think they have a they have a decent argument. There was, there was not an in-custody situation here. Just under four hours later, she was interviewed by a couple in Lowen, an unmarked car on scene. I think that's, she's in custody then. They're going to argue she wasn't. Although under both Ramirez and Rincon, this is not custody for person Miranda. I disagree. And she was given her Miranda warning. So even if she was in custody, she was given her Miranda warning. So the state's saying, even in the cop car, she wasn't in custody. I think there are good arguments that she was in custody. Regardless, the only question is if she was or wasn't in custody, if she was in custody, she has to be given a Miranda warning. So the state said, well, guess what? We don't think she was in custody, but even if she was, her Miranda warnings were read. For the reasons outlined in the state's response to the defendant's motion to suppress, uh, the Miranda warnings were not defective and her waiver of Miranda was voluntary and her statement was voluntary. Any motion to suppress on these statements should not be granted. So this was, again, going on the offensive in case they were going to make arguments later that not just the interrogation, but also the statements at the scene were to be suppressed. Let me just give a quick overview here of the case management conference. The audio was so bad. I only caught parts of it, but generally speaking, Owens is making certain objections to try to keep them preserved for making arguments later. It's not how it's done. If you have to give your objections, you have to give the objections and reasons why. So when there was some pushback by the state, Owens was like, well, Judge Miss Boone wants me to object to this stuff. And it's like, that's not a great reason. And that's not really how it's supposed to be done. And so now you're kind of getting an idea of maybe some of the issues between Boone and her lawyers. She was asking to do things that they didn't want to do or thought weren't appropriate. Owens seems to be doing at least some of them. Maybe, I mean, obviously he thinks they're legally appropriate. I don't think he would do anything he doesn't think are legally appropriate, but it does seem like he is succumbing to her suggestions more than some of the other lawyers may have. Um, there's a lot of witnesses they're trying to get deposition, deposition scheduled for. There are scheduling issues, all sorts of problems, and you're seeing how packing all this into one month and now one week has always seemed virtually impossible to me, which is why I always thought there'd be a short continuance. But right now, no continuance has been granted. And we're supposed to be going to trial in one week. Do you think that's possible? Let me know in the chat. Put October 7th if you think the tr trial is going to go forward on October 7th or continuance if you think this case is going to get continued. But that leads me to our, the last document we're going to break down. You know, I mentioned maybe doing some things that the other lawyers didn't want to do, but that Sarah Boone was pushing hard for. I can only imagine that this was the, one of those requests. And yes, you probably know what I'm referencing. That is 
the defendant's motion for a right to hair, cosmetics, and civilian clothing without restraints for trial. Comes now the defendant by and through the undersigned counsel moves this honorable court for an order permitting defendant to appear in all court proceedings pertaining to trial in civilian clothings without restraints instead of a jail uniform. In addition, the defendant requests that she be permitted the right to have her hair styled and access to makeup. In support thereof, the defendant states the following. Here we go. Statement of the facts. The defendant is presently incarcerated and is scheduled for trial on October 7, 2024. The defendant has been incarcerated for over four years and the defense would like access to professional, professional hairstyling. That's wild. That's a wild request to me. Professional hairstyling, cosmetics, and civilian clothing without restraints throughout the defendant's trial appearance in respect for the court and prospective jurors. Without the court entering an order permitting her access to such, the right to receive a fair trial will be permissibly infringed upon. So he wants no restraints, civilian clothing, professional hairstyling, and cosmetics. The right to appear in civilian clothing. Obviously, she's going to get this. Presumption of innocence is a basic component of the fundamental right to a fair trial. Since the defendant pending and during this trial is still presumed of innocent, he is entitled, and the reason it's in quotes and he is because it was a he in the case they're citing, uh, is entitled to be brought before the court with the appearance, dignity, and self-respect of a free and innocent man, except as the necessary safety and decorum of the court may otherwise require. He is therefore entitled to wear civilian clothes rather than prison clothing at his own trial. Uh, here, the defendant is scheduled for trial on October 7th. Defendant will not be transported, sorry, will be transported from the Orange County Jail daily for her trial proceedings. Defense counsel will be providing the defendant with professional attire for the court appearance. In addition, the defendant will need to obtain defendant's measurements. Therefore, the defendant requests this court enter an order placing the Orange County Jail on notice that one, defense is permitted to take defendant's measurements, and two, defendant is permitted to dress out in her civilian clothes for the trial proceedings. I see no issue with that. I think that's guaranteed to get granted. Right to appear without physical restraints. Allowing a defendant to appear before the jury in restraint devices is an inherently prejudicial practice that undermines the presumption of innocence and the right to a fair trial. Generally, a defendant in a criminal trial has the right to appear before the jury free from physical restraints, such as shackles or handcuffs. Uh, on September 19th, the defendant appeared in court bearing handcuffs and shackles. Defendant had hand restraints made it difficult for her to communicate with counsel in written note-taking form. In addition, it is reasonable to assume that the next court hearing will be covered by local and national media. And if the defendant is put on display to prospective jurors in jail garb, they will naturally be led to doubt in her presumption of innocence. Therefore, the defendant is requesting that the hand restraints be removed at all court proceedings from here on out and that both shackles and handcuffs be removed during trial proceedings. So this one, easily the handcuffs should be removed. But should there be a shock uh, band or shackles on her feet, that is going to be a decision made by the court when balancing the safety of the courtroom. Um, he's probably going to think about, you know, talk to the bailiffs, talk to the state, talk to everybody else about what we need to make sure we have a safe court, court environment. My perspective, I don't think she is really a flight risk or a danger. So I think minimal shackles, if anything, on her feet or a shock band is, is appropriate. Nothing on her hands, nothing that would be viewable to the jury because I do not think when balancing her presumption of innocence and what the jury is going to look at her like, um, I do think it should be limited. I'm not so sure it should be nothing as if she's not incarcerated. Um, like if you're not incarcerated and you're coming to trial every day, you obviously don't have shackles or handcuffs on and you're free to leave every day and come back like Karen Reed, for example. But because she's incarcerated, usually they're going to do something, maybe just a shock band uh, that's hidden under, you know, if they can hide it under her dress or pants or whatever those issues may be. The right to control appearance in the courtroom before the jury. The courts have recognized the defendant's appearance can significantly impact the jury's perception and consequently the fairness of the trial. In Williams, uh, the Supreme Court noted that compelling a defendant to stand trial in prison or jail clothing could impair the presumption of innocence, which is fundamentally to the adversary system. See, look at all the cases he's citing. This is great. This is how it's supposed to look. My guess is this is how Mr. Owens usually does it. The problem is he's citing cases about wearing uh, civilian clothes, which he's already cited before, which we already know is going to get granted. But now he's arguing for the cosmetics and hair, potentially from professionals. Allowing the defendant to present herself in a manner that does not unduly prejudice the jury is essential to ensuring her right to a fair trial and upholding the presumption of innocence. And while the court in Estelle specifically addressed the prison attire, the underlying principle applies to bro broadly to any aspect of the defendant's appearance. Oh, really? Does it say that? Uh, 
that could influence the jury's perception. Defendant has a right to appear before this jury and prospective jurors in the same manner as she would outside of confinement. Kind of. Uh, cosmetics and hairstyle is standard practice in presenting professional appearance if the individual so chooses. By extension, incarcerated males are permitted, are permitted a fresh shave and haircut. Accordingly, the defendant requests that she be permitted access to cosmetics and hairstyling throughout her trial proceedings, including voir dire. So let me just tell you, there's part of this I agree with. I think Sarah Boone should absolutely be able to do her hair as she wants. Makeup, there are safety protocols and concerns with that. Uh, sometimes inmates will hurt themselves with certain makeup products. Uh, so you can't just give them makeup or con that could be considered contraband if she takes it back to her cell with her or hides it. She could hurt somebody or pick a lock with, you know, maybe something you do eye makeup with or lips or something. I don't know. But uh, it can be dangerous or used as a tool. So no way anything that could possibly be dangerous. Now, if there's a way that they can give her some blush or something that wouldn't be dangerous or something she could apply, maybe some lipstick she could apply with her finger. I don't know. I don't really know how all of it works. Then potentially she should be allowed to put on makeup and do her hair herself. Same thing with her hair. You can't put anything sharp or anything problematic in your hair, but you can put your hair up on a ponytail. You can brush your hair, comb your hair, style your hair. You can still do all of that. So I think she absolutely should be allowed to do all that, but she shouldn't be giving spe given special treatment like professional hairstyles and cosmetic. Give me a break. That's wild. And there's no case law that allows you to do that. So I think she should absolutely be granted civilian clothing, very minimal, if any, um, shackles or shock collars. And she should be allowed to do her hair and maybe some minimal makeup that when balancing safety protocols, flight risks, things like that, um, that if there's a way to balance it and allow her to do that, I think that's absolutely appropriate. She is presumed innocent. She should be presented that way in front of a jury. A jury shouldn't automatically think she's guilty by the way that she looks and is sitting over there at council table. So I agree with a lot. You may not, you may be surprised. I agree with a lot that was in that last motion. And I don't think that that was something unethical that Sarah Boone was forcing them to do. Would I have ever asked for professional makeup and hair? No, I would never have asked for that. Um, I would have told Sarah, listen, we can ask for all this. I'm not going to put in their professional hairstylists. Who's paying for that too? The state's definitely not paying for it. And if Sarah Boone could pay for that, maybe she should pick up some of the tab the state's paying for. Maybe she was reached out to by one of her fans that's a professional hairstylist. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to speculate on it. But I do think she should be allowed a lot of that. But there is a line that always must be drawn. All right, guys, let me have it. Let me know what else has come in since this video posted or since I recorded this video. I'm sure more has happened. If you guys want me to continue following every move in the Sarah Boone case as we lead up to trial, please let me know um, in the comments and by liking this video. And please go watch the podcast. It helps us out a lot. Go like that one over there with Whitney as well so we can keep having fun doing those. I appreciate you guys so much. Until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.